First, a short <coughs> discussion that I want to point out that invariants are tensors. This I've kind of implied this over our past discussions, but I just sort of want to say this explicitly. So just a couple definitions just to refresh. So uh, we're going to leave some space for invariants. A variant Ti is called a first order contravariant tensor if from one coordinate system to another it transforms according to this rule. And it's called, and another variant, T upper I lower J, is called a second order invariant if from one coordinate system to another it transforms according to the rule that you see here. So every index gets its own Jacobian. And some other variant, variant meaning is obtained in any coordinate system by its own, by the same rule consistently applied, we've seen many examples of these, is, is a tensor, I won't summarize it, but of the kind indicated by its indicial signature, if it transforms according to this rule. Once again, every index gets its own Jacobian. So consistent with the scheme, an invariant is also a variant of order zero that transforms according to this rule. So maybe I'll write it like this, So because I don't have any indices to put primes next to. But basically you pursue the same recipe. You pursue the same recipe. You value contract away all indices. You end up with with a tensor with no indices, a tensor or a variant with no indices, a variant of order zero, and it's called an invariant if the values are the same in all coordinate systems. But the point of this whole discussion is that you can see it as being part of this scheme of being a tensor. So that's what I mean by the title that invariants are tensors. They're just tensors of order zero. And what's nice about this scheme is that everything, all the theorems that we have stated, invariants sort of become a special case. So for example, we had a theorem that said whatever tensor you have, I, J, K, L, if you contract any two of its indices, for example, T, I, I, J, L, if it started out as a tensor of order 4, and you contract two indices, then it becomes a tensor of order 2. So this is a tensor that will change according to this rule. That's the, you can call it the fundamental theorem of tensor calculus. It says the tensors under contraction remain tensors. And if you now take this object, then you contract away the remaining two indices, the result will once again be a tensor. So you can see it as a special case of the same theorem. It's just that it'll be a tensor of order zero. And a tensor of order zero, each index gets its own Jacobian, but there are no indices. So there are no Jacobians. So it's an invariant. So invariant is just a special case of tensor way of transformation. The tensor way of transformation is when every index gets a Jacobian to express the rule by which it transforms. And if there are no indices, it's just a special case. That's, that's all I'm really trying to say in this discussion. That all of these theorems apply to invariants, because invariant can be seen as a special form of tensor that gets no Jacobians because it has no live indices. And because it gets no Jacobians, it's an invariant. It means you get the same value in all coordinate systems. All of these expressions imply that you get different values in different coordinate systems. But because there are no indices, and therefore no Jacobians, means same value in all coordinate systems. That is not to say that every variant of order zero is an invariant. 
where is it? Tensor of order zero. Here's an example of one. It's actually very important. It'll come up either at the end of today or next week. So, as if we haven't used the letter Z enough, here comes one, def one more definition with the letter Z. The letter Z by itself represents the determinant of the covariant metric tensor. And so I don't waste indices, this is how I denote it. So the two dots on the bottom say, take the covariant, covariant matrix, excuse me, covariant metric tensor, evaluate its determinant in the matrix sense, and that's certainly a variant, because it's something that has no indices. It's just a number. Now let's think, is this variant an invariant? So for example, what is this value in Cartesian coordinates? One. One, One right? And what is this value in polar coordinates? R squared. R squared. So it's not an invariant. That's a good example. So here we go. That's probably the best example. Here is a variant. It is a variant because the right-hand side is an algorithm for how to calculate it in every coordinate system. And you just did it in two different coordinate systems. And if you thought a little harder, you would realize in spherical coordinates, can anyone remember? R squared sine theta. R to the fourth sine squared. And we call it theta. Because there are two R to the squared. Okay. We'll revisit that. And then, uh, but I know what you were talking about. You were talking about square root of Z. So square root of Z is R is 1 for Cartesian coordinates, R for polar coordinates, and R squared sine theta for spherical coordinates. And it is called the volume element. And you can kind of see why, because that's what will appear in the integral when you evaluate volumes. So there you go. Yes? I thought to have an invariant, you needed to have something covariant and something contravariant. No? That's usually how you arrive at invariant. But here's an invariant that doesn't have any, uh, that doesn't come from a combination of covariant and contravariant. Isn't that a giveaway that it's not an invariant? No. How about the position vector? The position vector is an invariant. But that has a contravariant component with the covariant basis. No. It's just called, we just call it R. It's defined as an arrow. To point from an arbitrary origin. If you have a velocity field, sure you can decompose it into a contravariant, into its contravariant components and the covariant basis. But before you decompose it, it's just an invariant. It's actually backwards. It's not that you take a contravariant tensor and the covariant basis, you put them together and you get the invariant velocity field. It's you start with the velocity field, you decompose it with respect to the covariant basis. And that's how you get the contravariant coordinates. So you can start with invariance. Here's another one. How about the determinant of, of the Kronecker delta? That's an invariant. It's one in all coordinate systems. That's a variant of order zero, and it's actually an invariant. Actually, we'll, we'll show that the determinant of any covariant, contravariant covariant tensor is an invariant. It's kind of pretty and good to know, but not for a doubly covariant basis. And here's where it'll become, so this discussion, we're, we're now going to switch to properties of the covariant derivatives. And the first property of the covariant derivative Recall its definition, we'll write it down again. The first property of the covariant derivative will be that covariant derivatives apply to an invariant is, is equivalent to the partial derivative. So it will fall within this scheme. Of course, it applies, covariant derivatives can be applied to variants that are not necessarily invariants, but nevertheless, it's this kind of thing going on. Okay, so that's it for this little segment. Let's pause.